synchrotron light to perform uh, photomish ex experiments. And uh, so the idea to have an experimental talk uh, here in uh, this uh, theoretical school is uh, to remind you, first of all, that uh, physics is an experimental science. So of course we, we like to study the theory, but uh, we, we need uh, to start from experiments. And then uh, Paulina will give us uh, the experimental view on the bus structure and the properties of materials. Uh, so it's important to, to keep that in mind. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, how to use the pointer? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My bad. Oh, okay. Okay. Avanti e indietro. Pointer. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me and for giving me the possibility to make this talk. Uh, uh, I am an experimentalist, so uh, my idea is to give you a broad idea of what is the experimental photoemission spectroscopy. I will introduce the photoemission spectroscopy from an experimentalist point of view, uh, give you some details, uh, not too much details of the photoemission experiments, some examples of the angular solid photoemission of simple two-dimensional electronic bands, and we talk about the potentiality. Ah, potentiality of ARPES, yeah, okay. I can take out the mask. So, uh, ARPES, uh, uh, the photoemission, uh, as you know, probably is based on the photoelectric effect when the uh, uh, light with sufficient en energy is eliminating the sample surface. Sorry, uh, Polina, I think we have an issue because the, on Zoom we are not looking at the, the slides, so I have to, to check with the, the guy. Because we are, we are just seeing uh, the video, but not the slides. Uh, I think we Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now we also see the slides. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, when the uh, bulk sample is eliminated with uh, some light with sufficient energy, it can leave the electrons. So uh, this effect has been discovered uh, in 1886 for the first time. It was explained by Albert Einstein in uh, 1905. So the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons does not depend on the intensity of the light. It depends on the on the Pattern uh, energy of the beam and on uh, some parameters, uh, for example, also the uh, work function uh, that is the potential that uh, electrons need to overcome while leaving the surface. So uh, the, here is the uh, simple relation between the uh, electronic structure inside the um, uh, solid and the outside of the solid of the photoemission spectrum. So it's uh, just the, the energy scale is just simply translated from the binding energy to the kinetic energy by using this relation. So we can see also that uh, there is a sudden drop of the intensity above the Fermi level of the maximal energy that can, uh, maximal kinetic energy that the uh, electrons can have. So in just below the Fermi level, we can see this complex structure. This is uh, derived from the valence band electrons that are um, weakly bounded. Then deeper in the energy, we can see the core levels which are, uh, have easier shapes somehow. And there is also a exponentially growing background that, can, uh, that is derived from the inelastically scattered electrons. Uh, and also the information of this background can also be used uh, for analyzing the um, uh, electronic properties of the materials. For example, it can be used to determine the work function of the element. Uh, the core levels are typically used to analyze the chemical composition of the materials, also the, its atomic composition, stoichiometry, and so on. And the, one of the important parts is also the electronic structure, uh, electron band structure, which is close to the Fermi level, which is given by the valence band electrons. So the main scope of the photoemission analysis is to reconstruct the behavior of the electron inside the sample from its uh, photoemission spectrum. So uh, the typical photoemission setup uh, just need uh, these three elements. It is a photon source, 
It can be, for example, a ultraviolet lamp, it can be X-ray tube, it can be synchrotron, it can be laser, free electron laser, and so on. It needs a sample that need, will be eliminated by light, and it needs an electron analyzer that uh, the most common, uh, usually, electron analyzer are the hemispherical analyzers, and then there are some more exotic types of analyzers, like momentum microscope, type of light microscope, and so on. And the sample for the photoemission need to be ordered, solid, like uh, it might be bulk material, might be thin film, might be multi-layer or molecular rail, and so on. So these are typical photon sources that are used for the photoemission. The first two, the gas discharge lamps and X-ray tubes, these are commonly used in the laboratories, in the laboratory photoemission. They are, say, relatively, they have relatively low cost. They are um, more available than the rest, and they, but they have, say, somehow lower resolution. Typically, the resolution much lower, and they have large spot sites. And then there is also, uh, they also have fixed uh, photon energy. Uh, for studying the valence band, one uh, normally use the, um, the gas charge lamps uh, that provide this typical to photon energies. And then also the X-ray tubes are commonly used to study the uh, uh, core levels. Then the synchrotron lights, which uh, is, uh, say, the one of the commonly used uh, techniques to study the electronic structure. It provides a continuously tunable uh, light within a very broad range of the energy. It has also high intensity brilliance. It has variable polarization and can also have smaller spot size and many other advantages. Then there are also uh, laser sources uh, to provide the light on the sample. And uh, they typically have a limited range of energies. But their advantage is that they can permit the time result studies, and they also have uh, much higher uh, energy resolution. And there are also some exotic, uh, more exotic things which are uh, more hard to access as a uh, free electron laser. Uh, this is uh, a typical example of uh, a photoemission beamline. This is, uh, all this is needed just to bring the light uh, on the sample and to study the photoemission. So for the photoemission beamline, you typically need a synchrotron. You need all these optics like uh, undulator, you need uh, this mirror, you need a monochromator in order to produce a uh, monochromated uh, uh, light and to give, uh, to achieve a very high energy resolution and uh, all these mirrors and, and so on. So uh, synchrotron uh, uh, light uh, uh, based photoemission so far is considered one of the most powerful tools in studying the bus structure of the elements in the photoemission. Uh, but the disadvantage of the, uh, this technique is that you typically need a synchrotron. And so uh, to access an experimental synchrotron, one needs to write an experimental proposal, which is a sort of project. And these projects uh, need to be approved and done uh, in proposal committee. So uh, typically to perform an experiment uh, at synchrotron, you need from three to 12 months from the time you decide to do an experiment in case your uh, proposal is successful. Um, so, uh, the, typically the uh, photoemission is uh, uh, made in this um, range of energies that is from uh, 10 to 1000 electron volt. It's so-called surface sensitive regime. So if you will look on the inelastic mean free parts of the outcoming electrons, that means the, the maximum uh, inelastic mean free parts is uh, not, not more than two nanometers. That means that compared to the typical thickness of monatomic layers of elementary materials means at maximum you will prop 10 layers uh, in the surface in the say in the like if you use 5 to 100 electron volt it would be it would be even smaller so we'll prop 1 to 2 monatomic layers and uh, th this uh, particularity in, uh, asks for a very clean surfaces and also it asks for uh, ultra high vacuum conditions uh, in a way that your sample surface can be measured without being destroyed within several hours. So, and also for photoemission, the samples need to be conductive. So the samples might be, for, for the photoemission can be either prepared ex situ, like bulk crystals, like several topological materials. Uh, they can be prepared outside. They can bring, be, be brought in the, um, in the experimental station. They can be cleaved in order to get the clean surface. They can be exfoliated like graphene samples. Uh, either it can also be pre prepared in situ or the same topological insulators 
may be grown by in big growth. Uh, the graphene can be preparated also in situ by dosing some gas, by chemical vapor deposition, uh, and so on. And also the clean surfaces can be prepared by sputtering annealing uh, techniques. So this is typical layout of experimental setup for studying the photo emission. So you need a place from where you insert the samples. And then you need all these uh, experimental uh, facilities uh, to prepare the samples, uh, to dose the gases, to sputter, to anneal, to cool, to heat up the samples, and also for uh, making some basic checks of the sample surface. And uh, then, uh, sorry, uh, then uh, you can uh, finally, when you are, think your sample is ready, you can transfer it in front of the beam. And you can take the, your uh, photo emission with, uh, normally with the, um, with the analyzer. So, and uh, this is how in, uh, the real, uh, in reality all this stuff looks like. So this uh, big piece is the hemispherical analyzer uh, that uh, uh, measures the photo emission spectra. This is the, these are the experimental chambers. These are all the, the facilities to prepare like gas bottles and so on. These are manipulators in order that you can transfer the samples here and there uh, and prepare them. And there is also all these uh, big features that are um, destined to uh, create and maintain the UHV condition, ultra high vacuum condition, so that the sample surface may remain clear, uh, clean. Sorry. Uh, so uh, what is the typical, uh, how does the typical photoemission spectrum look like? Uh, so uh, for example, if I talk about the XPS or SK, when we use somehow, normally people talk about XPS, they are talking about somehow high energies, high photon energies, but XPS spectrum can be also taken in uh, surface sensitive regime and you can take it also, even with helium lamp, you can take this spectrum. So normally in uh, this type of experiment, you are not interested in the angle distribution of electrons. You are typically taking the intensity of the emitted electrons uh, as a function of their kinetic or binding energy. So the conversion uh, of this type of spectra is very easy. You just scale the uh, kinetic energy into the binding energy, and that's all. So this is a typical uh, spectrum that is taken on topological insulator, tin bismol telluride. Uh, these are his, uh, it's, uh, uh, these sharp peaks are the core levels from which we can understand the sample composition. Uh, also we can understand the, analyze the ratio between the peaks and uh, so we can uh, check the sample composition whether there's some, it has the, the co correct sti stichiometry. And close to the Fermi level, we can see the valence states which uh, in this uh, particular case are very, very weak with respect to the core levels. And uh, the, uh, this space analysis can also provide many useful information uh, on the samples. For example, this is the study on the molybdenum carbide, uh, Maxen. And uh, if it has, uh, so this study shows uh, two peaks uh, that are related for the molybdenum and carbon, which are intrinsically, uh, they, they are the elements of which the uh, maxen is built. And we can estimate the, from these two cores, we can estimate the ratio between the two elements. We can say whether there is some excess of carbon uh, and say that the material synthesis was correct or not correct. We can also see some adsorbides, which are uh, on top of uh, the materials. Normally, this, uh, uh, Core levels are fitted uh, with different procedures in order to, uh, to find different components in the spectrum from these uh, components, from the binding energy of the components, you can understand something about the type uh, of the chemical, um, chemical state of these elements. And uh, finally, you can just also without information uh, about the angle, angular distribution of the electrons, you can also see the valence band and from just from the shape of the valence band, you can say where the material is uh, isolating or it is metallic. Okay, and when uh, one uh, talks of the valence uh, band, normally the people uh, study the valence band with angle resolution emission. That means that uh, also the emission angles of the electron is uh, uh, taken into account. So uh, basically for this reason, uh, either one can use a single channel analyzer 
uh, that uh, can just analyze one emission angle uh, of the electron and then you can rotate the analyzer. But the result is always the same as the intensity of the emitted electron versus kinetic energy. Either in the modern analyzers, you can uh, take in parallel several uh, angles on the, on the detector. You can uh, take like several hundred of uh, uh, channels at the same time. You always save the same spectra. You will have uh, some 600 spectra at the same time. And uh, uh, conventionally, these spectra are shown like uh, image plots, where the brighter color corresponds to higher intensity and the darker color corresponds to lower intensity in this particular plot. But there are also some very exotic color scales that are used in ARPES. Uh, so then this uh, one need also to link the information about this uh, spectra that is measured to the bands inside the structure. For, for what regard is regards, uh, for, uh, regarding the two-dimensional bands and the simple system, uh, it's, uh, the relation is rather easy because the parallel mom momentum of the electron that is parallel to the surface is conserved. So it can be directly... Uh, um, directly converted from the uh, angle using this formula. And the binding energy of the electrons can be also get from its kinetic energy using these uh, simple relations. They can be simply related to the Fermi level if the sample is metallic. And uh, what is particular also of this type of conversion that the spanned range uh, uh, of the angular uh, of the wave vector depends strongly also on the photon energy. So the lower photon energy you, you use, the smaller information you will get. And uh, it can also be, the, uh, the field of view can also be widened, but in the case you have to take several uh, spectra rotating the sample and so on. And um, then, in case one wants to study the anisotropy of the sample, one can take the uh, Fermi surface mapping of the sample. Either he can rotate the sample in front of the analyzer, uh, or he can just, uh, like here, tilt the sample uh, in front of the analyzer. Also, in some modern analyzers, this procedure can be done uh, from the analyzer optics. And then one can get a three-dimensional set of data. If from there, one can build uh, one can cut and get, uh, for example, the Fermi surface if he cut this cube at the Fermi level are the, some constant energy cuts and he can understand uh, something more about the band's anisotropy. So the uh, band structure in the case of simple dimensional uh, um, systems can uh, also be very easily compared to the LDI-DFT calculations. Uh, for example, here I show a uh, an example of uh, silver thin films and uh, its electronic band structure, which is uh, analog of the particle in a box uh, picture. So we can see this uh, number of quantized states, which are uh, quantum well states uh, in film, thin films uh, that are due to the electron confinement in thin film. And we can see that ARPES can uh, very ni nicely show very similar uh, parabolic-like states, uh, which are, uh, which have, was form also is very similar to what DFT calculations predict. Uh, next, uh, there is uh, some example which we did. These are example on uh, uh, quantum well stage, which we are observed on iridium or on ethereum thin films. So we can see that for sufficiently thick films, we can observe, uh, an, oh, sorry, a number of states that uh, cross the Fermi level, and this uh, number of states increase with the film thickness, from where we can uh, deduce that all these states are coming indeed from some bulk state, which is supposed to cross the Fermi level. But the, initially, the DFT calculation was not able to uh, explain our findings, uh, and uh, it, because it was providing some uh, very different quantum, very different electronic structure with flatter states, and they were all located above the Fermi level. In, uh, in this case, it was shown that one can uh, improve uh, the agreement by taking into account the self-energy correction. In this way, he can get very good uh, agreement with the band structure. Uh, so, not only uh, after including this uh, uh, self-energy correction, it was found that uh, ethereum also have some. XCP terbium also have some topological properties which emerge after one takes into account this um, um, uh, self-energy correction uh, by, by Hubbard uh, 
Hubbard correction. So it's in this way, the ARPAs and DFT were uh, nicely collaborating and found also some which, uh, which was not, not, not there before. That was the first evidence for a direct northern line in uh, Atlanta in the middle. So uh, then uh, also there are some examples uh, of other uh, simple bond structure like graphene. For example, uh, for the free state and graphene, there is uh, a very good agreement between the band structure calculations and also uh, graphene on low interacting substrate like uh, graphene on silicon carbide. And you can uh, find this uh, Diracon very close to the Fermi level. And the only difference with the calculation might be just the energy shift of the bands due to the doping. And uh, uh, differently, in uh, graphene that is grown on some interacting substrate, the ARPAs can provide the information whether uh, there, is, there are strong interaction with the substrate. Uh, if, in case you see the, uh, for example, this uh, Diracon that comes to, uh, close to the sur Fermi surface, you can judge that uh, there is, uh, the material is, is more freestanding-like. But when it is, uh, for example, the nickel is inter intercalated below the graphene, you can see that the graphene is nearly destroyed. And so ARPES can uh, say that there is, now there is more interaction with the substrate. In the same way, uh, it can work in the reverse way. So when the graphene is strongly interacted, one can intercalate the silver below the graphene level and restore the linear shape of the graphene and say that, okay, now the graphene is mostly freestanding. So ARPES can probe also the degree of the interaction of the material with the substrate. Uh, another example of the study of the two-dimensional material is the study of silicin. Silicin is uh, uh, also the uh, analog of graphene that is built of uh, silicin atom arranged in a holding comb lattice. Uh, with a difference with graphene, these atoms are uh, slightly, this sheet is slightly buckled, so it's expected to induce some particular properties in the graphene band structure in uh, low buckled uh, low buckled configuration. The graphene is expected, to, or silicine is also expected to show a Diracon close to the Fermi level, very, very similar to that of graphene. And since uh, silicine was uh, grown on the silver 111 surface, uh, there was an er early ARPES um, report that they also observed uh, something which was uh, a linear band close to the Fermi level. And since they were expecting a linear band from the calculations, this, okay, it was uh, reported as a uh, evidence of the uh, direct con like state in the silicine. But uh, uh, indeed, then, if one analyzes uh, carefully the band structure in two dimensional, like take uh, about anisotropy, it can uh, be seen that this band was not having the correct topology. It was what not a, a con, it was just a satellite point. That means you see maxima along one direction and minima along another direction. And indeed, the uh, calculations that were taken into account the substrate were shown that there is a very strong interaction with the substrate. So the original Diracon is destroyed, and so there is uh, uh, no more Diracon. And also the states which are seen, they are mostly the silver states that, uh, that they are modified by uh, silicon. Okay, so just, uh, just to, to be sure that not every linear band is necessarily a Diracon and it uh, always requires a 3D analysis. Okay, so uh, sh shall I go to go fast? Well, uh, I think we have a few more minutes, so... Okay, then I can skip to probably this part. Uh, just I will tell about the uh, importance of the topology uh, of the photon energy dependent ARPAs that is provided by synchrotron. Uh, the, uh, the band structure, as the previous lecture taught, is very sensitive to photon energy. In particular, uh, you can uh, see different uh, features in a different manner. For example, this is a uh, topology conciliator bismuth selenide, and you can see that there is uh, much more intensity on the surface state with respect to the bulk states and varying the photon energy. Uh, you can uh, choose the, m mostly the feature which you want to see. It can be also very crucial. Since, for example, in this case, there are some uh, selected photon energy where you can see the uh, topological surface state, while at, some, at a different energy you do not see it. Uh, and uh, initially it was claimed that there is no topological surface state in this uh, type of uh, anti-ferromagnetic topological insulator. And also the photon energy dependent ARPES can uh, provide the information on the bulk bands uh, the, of the states that can, they can also be converted to the wave vector of the electron inside the material. The relation is a bit more 
complicated and uh, also needs to need several assumptions like for a uh, the um, final states in the form of free electron like states then from there one can also relate the uh, variation in the, uh, in the intensity of the states in uh, their position with the bulk states that are shown by uh, calculations and uh, okay there are also Okay, I believe I do not have much time. <laughs> okay, there, there is also the one of the most ad advances of the ARPA set that can allow us to measure the spin result band structure. It can be also done in uh, not only for one spin, uh, spin direction, but also for all three dimensions. One can take the vectorial spin analysis. Uh, uh, for example, it could also be done in the form of uh, uh, angle results for the emission together with the spin resolution can provide these bands. The uh, time which is required to take this type of maps is uh, due to the sensitivity of spin resolve with ARPAS is much higher, like uh, this uh, might take uh, several hours uh, with respect that this might take several minutes. It's uh, the, um, no, just this order of magnitude uh, higher, uh, the time which is needed. Uh, this can be done also for topological uh, surface state. The uh, spin resolve ARPAS can be also used to uh, resolve between the individual bands that are um, closely aligned, that's, that's so close that even the band width is higher than the peak separation. Using the spin resolution, they can finally resolve also the, uh, the features which are not uh, possible to resolve otherwise. Okay, uh, there are also uh, the, the laser based ARPAS can uh, probe the non occupied band structure and also can uh, allow for studying on the dynamics of the states that are excited. There are also, I have, <laughs> then I have to skip probably a bit faster now because we are running. Then uh, there are also uh, some um, extensions to ARPAS that can use the some. Uh, uh, focusing elements and then allow to reduce the uh, uh, spot size on the samples to several microns in this way one can study an inhomogeneous sample and then can find uh, very, uh, very small pieces of the elements and study their band structure. One can also use the electrical gating for some layer materials in this way uh, apply the um, electronic voltage to the uh, electrical voltage to the sample, uh, roughly speaking, and uh, uh, also uh, move the Fermi level to the material and access the non-occupied states. This is uh, some very new uh, experiments which were recently done also at Electra Synchrotron. And uh, one, uh, and, okay, and the last part is that uh, one can also use uh, another type, or completely another type of electron spectroscopy, that instead of uh, measuring the spectra, it can measure the um, inverse, uh, it can take, take all the electrons from the surface, and they all project it on the image plane, and uh, so instead of spectra, you are getting this, directly you get this uh, constant energy cuts, and then with the, this is called my mind to microscope because they are not res resolved in angle, but they resolve it in inverse angstrom space directly. In this uh, structure can also be coupled to spin, but in this case, so far the spin uh, is measured only along one spin quantization axis. In this way, you can also get directly the constant energy counters that are spin resolved, and uh, you can take them as form as. Uh, as uh, photon energy and you can uh, build all the three-dimensional uh, band structure of the element uh, with spin resolution. And, uh, okay, and okay, so I come to the conclusion. So photomission spectroscopy is one of the most direct experimental methods to probe the electronic structure of solids and there are a rich variety of uh, light sources and detection systems. And uh, the ARPES is in, there are a lot of new developments in the field of ARPAS, uh, new, uh, much new instrumentation is coming uh, in the last years, and okay, the possibilities of ARPAS are <laughs> continuously growing. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. So thank you very much, Polina. I think there were very nice examples uh, to, from which to start for the discussion. So let me just start with uh, a comment for the example of uh, silicine on uh, uh, silver was the, the example. And I think, it, it, I mean, I guess the, one of the points of this talk is that uh, ARPES is what uh, is a very powerful technique to get the mass structure and to directly connect with what we do. But there are a lot of technicalities, which Paulina was discussing, the photon energy, 
the sensitivity to the surface, uh, the substrate, etc. And so we have a really to pay attention to when we do a calculation, uh, not to jump to the conclusion that we can directly describe uh, what is measured experimentally. And I think the example of silicine is, uh, is nice because uh, I'm sure there was some theoretician who was ready to say, yeah, this is exactly the band of silicine. I'm able to compute it and I get the same. But in the end, it was the band of uh, the substrate. Yeah, so, it was just, uh, as far as I remember, it was depending also on the thickness of the slab one was using yeah. for the calculation. When one was using uh, like a five uh, layer slab, one was shown uh, a linear band, but also these linear bands are coming from silver itself. Exactly. So yeah. the, the point so. is that pay attention, not to just directly jump to, to the conclusion. Yeah, maybe it's a question. Huh? Yeah, okay, so then we can start with the questions, maybe, yeah. And uh, first of all, if there is someone in the audience. Okay. And then. So I just want to know, please, can you please comment on this, uh, the layer resolved uh, measurement. How deep can you measure? So uh, sorry? The layer resolved, yes, yeah, measurement. So how deep you can go in the, in the sample? How deep we can go on the sample? It depends on the photon energy, uh, basically. Uh, if we look, oh sorry. If I look on this um, uh, photo, uh, this one. So basically you look, uh, in, it depends on the photon energy. In this photon energy where a photoemission probes, it can go like two nanometers. That means up to 10 atomic layers. Okay. Um, hello, uh, I just want to ask about the part that uh, uh, ARPES plus spin that uh, you introduced. Uh, is it possible to find the lifetime of the, uh, this electron that uh, just uh, excited and going to the higher state? I know that there is an example for also spin resolve it, like uh, these are, I just introduced these time resolved studies. Mm -hmm. I know that this can be also performed with uh, spin resolution. Ah, okay. The problem of these time resolved studies, uh, it was in my experience, that you always, normally you have very low resolution. So you have already low resolution when you study the time resolved structure, plus when you are adding the spin, you are normally decreasing by 100 of times all the, so you're increasing by 100 of times all the acquisition times. Ah, so okay. these are some particular measurements. I have seen some of them in the literature, but it can be done as far oh, as I know. Okay, thank you. And then, Pauline, in the static measurement, you can also inspect the line width to say something about uh, the lifetime, no? Oh. Is it, oh. Yeah, probably, yes. So, that's not a lifetime. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, we have four questions from, from the chat. Okay. Can one say that there is band crossing if the observed band gap is of 1 to 10 millilitron volt? Oh, it depends on the resolution of your system normally. Uh, so there are some dedicated beam lines that we study very high resolution. Uh, you have to go to very low temperature probably. You have to increase your uh, resolution by several times probably with the laser, uh, laser based techniques. Uh, like here you can uh, effectively do this. And the second question is that is, how can we choose the exact probing energy in order to photo eject the electrons from the materials? I think is, uh, the question is how you select the photon energy on oh. the basis of what? Uh, normally what you select in the, in the photon energy is when you better see the feature. So you can, uh, when you have a tun tunable energy, you can just take several energies and s select what you are interested in, where you have better contrast there to see. When you can uh, have uh, emission from the sample, you just need uh, to have a photon energy that is higher than the work function. It's typically, I don't know, uh, four, five, six, seven electron volt. And there is actually a question interesting about the minima in the plot of the mean free path as a function of kinetic energy. Is wondering why there is a minimum at 100 EV. Uh, yeah, it's from 50 to 100 uh, EV. Yeah, because, okay, I'm not ready to answer this question. 
I know that at uh, lower energies, the uh, electrons can uh, penetrate uh, deeply into the sample. That, uh, that uh, what I know, but uh, it was, uh, I believe it is also not available for, uh, the curve is not also is not available for the materials. <laughs> yeah, I believe the theoretician may answer better this question. <laughs> Can we detect electron phonon coming Maybe. by ARPAS? Uh, yes, uh, basically we can. Uh, I'm not expert of that because our uh, beamline is not uh, some very high resolution. We do say a lot of uh, a bit of everything. So I know that uh, uh, electron phonon coupling, for example, can be nicely seen here even in the copper 111 surface state when you use the uh, laser by star, but it was, has a, a very good beam stability and a very good energy resolution and so on. So you can see this kink, sorry, uh, the electron photon coupling can be seen that the, you do not see a straight band which comes directly to the Fermi status. You can see there is this change in the band slope, and from there one can estimate this, um, uh, these different parameters that are related to the electron photon coupling. Okay, the last question is that is how tricky is to prepare the samples for performing ARPAS measurements? Can we control the environment to avoid, for instance, oxidation at the surface? Uh, yeah, of course, that we uh, say in our system we can do that because uh, in uh, our photomission um, uh, beamline we can uh, go very high in the energy. We can, okay, here it's not written, but uh, we can go up to 1000 of electron volts. That means we are covering the uh, uh, core levels of the oxygen. So we can also follow, uh, okay, like it was in this example, we can also see what happens to the oxygen. The, 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 how it's difficult to prepare the sample, it depends also on the sample. Some sample like a topological insulator, you can just bring into the vacuum, uh, you cleave the surface and you can uh, measure it. Sometimes you can spend several days just trying to prepare the uh, surface and you are not getting it. It depends a lot. Okay, so any more question from the audience? Uh, so it may sound super stupid, but uh, how do you separate the band structures of uh, the ma interested material and the substrates of play? For example, uh, how do you post-process these things? Uh, one can distinguish between the surface-related features and the bulk-related features by taking the photon energy dependence. Uh, if you have a synchrotron, then you can tune the light and basically the surface-related features like here, uh, you see this, uh, sorry. This uh, cut, the surface relative switch, which is the surface state, they remain fixed. They do not change their position with the photon energy. While the bike derived feature, they normally change. It also is not always like this. For example, in the case of silicine, that feature which was uh, reported for silicine as a Diracon, it was not changing uh, with the photon energy. But because this is some particular silver state that uh, stays there because the density of states is high there. Okay, so thank you very much, Pauline, again. I guess it's time for lunch. Everyone yeah. is ready to go to eat. And yeah. Thank you, Pauline. And okay, so now for lunch, we will...